Hi, everyone. Um, you can't know how much I'd like to be on stage there in Zurich with um, all of you, and I'm sure lots of us are feeling this way. But uh, this way, I saved on some CO2. So um, let me share my screen, and we'll get started. Um, I'm going to take you on a little bit here. Let me pull this up so I can do it big. So you can see I have gray hair and I have done a lot of startups. Um, this one is the one I'm most well known for, Zipcar, which I found co-founded in 2000. And I just wanna sit on this for a minute. What was amazing about Zipcar was I knew absolutely nothing at all about transportation at that time, except for I was a user. And, and we did this at a moment. So Zipcar is when you have this, you have car sharing in um, Switzerland, in fact. So it's cars by the hour or by the day. And what we did that was completely novel is we invented the technology that let you made that, make that reservation online and it got sent in real time to the car. And then when you held your card key at the right spot, the car would open to the right person at the right time. The early days when we were brand new, the month before we were launching, which was in June of 2000, here was how we, here was our beta test with the 30 users who had signed on. We had one car that was sitting on the street out here out front and people would make a reservation online and it was like a calendar, like for a you know, hairdresser's appointment. You would type, you would type in, you know, I want it from 1.30 to 2.30. Then you would walk to my house. You would walk up the side yard, up the stairs, onto the porch, lift the pillow off the couch and the car keys weren't there. And then you would go to the car and in the glove box, you would fill out start odometer, stop odometer, you know, start time, stop time. And then you would return the keys back under the pillow. And so that was the first month of operation. And then um, once we launched, I feel like it was like a black box. So people could hold their proximity card on the windshield and the door unlocked. But the reality was anyone with that card could have unlocked a car and the keys were dangling um, underneath the steering wheel. And if you had broken into that car and stuck the key into the ignition, it would have worked. So it was a very, for the first few months until we did make all the fancy technology that we have today. Um, but in these early days, it was really, really light. So I want you to hold that thought. Um, Zipcar was incredibly successful. It's a moment whose time has come and I'm very, very proud of it. I think we were a cornerstone of the sharing economy, the collaborative economy, one of the first wireless um, consumer applications. And so um, in 2007, I started a company called GoLoco. And GoLoco is, uh, was a ride sharing company, just as you have blah, blah car today in Europe. So it was, if you're going from Boston to New York City, um, you could get in. Let me just move on. You'll watch me age here. Um, in 2010, I launched a company called Buzzcar in Paris. And Buzzcar was peer-to-peer -peer car sharing. And um, this company, we were probably nine companies launched in Paris with the same idea in 2010. And we were not the number one and we merged with them and that was Drivey and Drivey has now merged with Get Around. Um, and so I own a very, 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 very small piece of that company. And in 2012, I did Venium, which is a vehicle network communications company. And uh, my co-founder is uh, the brains behind this. And he is still running this um, and it's a um, network company that takes data from the car and throws it into the cloud very, very efficiently and using lots of different types of spectrum. And then most recently in 2018, um, you can see how I've aged up to today. I launched this new urban mobility um, alliance because I care a lot about climate change and transportation emissions are um, the number one industry sector in the world. So where I wanna go with this is I wanna take you back to GoLoco which as I said, was a ride sharing company. And what was interesting about this time is I thought, oh, I'm really smart now. I know a lot of things because I had done Zipcar, I'd been really successful. We were way ahead of the cure curve. And I would say 10 or 15 years ahead of anybody else I'm using technology in an amazing way. I now understand trans transportation, I'm not a novice. So I spent the first, I, and I went out and I raised money, um, much, much more easily than I did the first time because now I was an experienced entrepreneur with a great track record. And I spent about six months designing what that 
technology, what that interface would look like. And my pitch was, oh, smartphones now exist. We know how, you know, we know you're, where you're geolocated. Um, and you would use the app to be able to say, here's who I am, here's my social networks, here's the car I have, here's where I'm going, here's the day and time, here's groups that I love, we can talk about things we're interested in. And as I say, I spent about six months and built this kind of robust platform before we launched. And then here was number one, um, failure number one. It was a complete disaster that what, what I learned after having spent a lot of money and hiring a person who had, I was an early Google employee who had worked on their layout and their spare, their spare um, website and what the icons and the interfaces would look like. And I had really chosen this great person who listened to me is that I didn't start with a minimum viable product. I thought, oh, I'm really smart now. So instead of touching customers right away, like I had done with Zipcar, and you know, out of the gate, I had barely any technology and we had, we had a big idea, but very little technology and we iterated and iterated and iterated. Here I thought, oh, I'm really smart. Let me, let me build this website up and then launch with this build website. And so then I spent the next six months unbuilding, 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 making it more and more and more and more streamlined. Because what I learned was even though ride sharing, you would think you have to say, I'm here and I want to drive there. And this is the day or the time I want to do it. No one wanted to put in that much. Very specific vehicles parked in very specific places. This was all virtual in a sense that, you know, people could match rides across the country. And so, you know, if you wanted to go from Boston to New York, or if you wanted to go from, I don't know, small town in the Midwest to Chicago, I mean, I, I really thought, hey, you know, this is, this is something that can happen anywhere. Even though we're gonna do marketing in certain areas, I just was not laser focused on the idea that what you wanna do when you've got a startup is you wanna figure out not only what is my minimum product, but what is my minimum path to a success that I can hold up and raise more money with, or I can hold up to the press, or I can hold up to users and say, whoa, look how great we were at this. And so now we can start expanding, expanding, expanding the market. And you know, we should have started with New York to Boston, something that has a lot of traffic going back and forth. But instead in my mind, oh, all university campuses, you know, employers with large, with a large footprint. And so I think, you know, we we just were too large a geography. Which leads me to number three, like how stupid was I? Why did I not look more closely at understanding why I was successful at Zipcar, which was I did a minimum viable product and we really were really cautious with our geographies and added cars um, in this organic bit by bit way. So we didn't lose very much money and we were doing a great job. And so I, I wanna iterate, which I guess lots of people have, Failure, I think we all fail, but it's not failure if you learn something from it. And I used to tell my staff at Zipcar and in other companies, we're doing something for the first time. No one has ever done these things. So of course, we don't know what we're doing and we're gonna do the best we can. The path to success though is recognizing those failures, recognizing those problems and change them absolutely as fast as you can. Um, the previous speaker was just talking about what it's like inside big companies. And this is why startups succeed is because startups are so close to the customer and so close to every process. When you see that something sucks, change it immediately, quick, move on. And I feel that I think of this as I put this sentence here, intellectual honesty. When I talk to entrepreneurs, I think the ones that succeed are the ones who are most honest with themselves about their skills, with the success of their idea as envisioned, with their willing to see problems and iterate and maybe start transforming and taking the company to a different path. But people who don't succeed and who fail terminally are people who think they're always right, never examine failure, never think that they personally can fail, and you will never get ahead with that. So I think failure is an incredibly important learning process. And I wanna say it's also not fun. Um, with Go Loco, after two years of spending half of the money I had raised, I gave that money back to the investors. And I said, you know what? 
I've tried everything I know how to try. Um, and when all the stars are aligned and we're in the exact perfect situation for real ride sharing, no one chooses to ride share. And so I'd say the difference between, and, and in the intervening now 13 years or 10 years since I gave my money back to investors, there has been no successful ride sharing company in the US. I would put Uber and Lyft in the category of taxis driven by people with their own cars. It's not ride sharing. Um, and so Blablacar, who was founded by a friend of mine, he, Blablacar is very successful because it's operating under a different economic structure than we have in the US and that you can get lots of places without a car in Europe. You can be very car independent, but you can use car certain times and public transit and mass transit is very expensive for those long distances. Whereas in the US, you can't get any place by public transport. You're competing with cheap car ownership, not with other ways of raising money. So I think that is what I have to say. Um, failure is important and we all are happy to talk about our failure when it's a lot of years in the past or when we catch it really early. So um, catch your failures as quickly as you can and move on. And then just one upbeat thing is if you're looking at your company really, really closely for failures in yourself or in your company, that inspection of the details also lets you capture opportunities and amazing things that you didn't know about your company that are benefits and advantages that you can capitalize on quickly and run with those. So I, I think this close in, this inspection of and knowledge of your company and the ability to move quickly helps you on both the upside and the downside. Um, thanks, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it back to you.